was here dropping in on you. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank you for stopping in to listen to this very important message on protecting our beautiful black children uh, from so many different threats. And I'm going to do the best I can to lay this out in this presentation. A couple of things that you need to remember. Number one is that this is gonna be a two part uh, presentation in one rendering. So when first part ends, don't, don't, don't shut down because shortly after that, the second part uh, begins. So watch the entire thing and I'm going to give you some insight on what I've learned over the years in my research and in the rendering of different programs. Um, before I do, I want to remind you, we are in the middle of a fundraiser. It is so uh, important that you guys support the work that we are doing. Uh, hopefully by the time this is over, you'll see uh, at least a small portion of why it's important based on the work that I've done, based on the work we continue to do. So uh, we're going to talk today about a specific threat, a genetic and emotional and psychological threat combined. We're going to talk about epigenetics and adverse childhood experiences and the manner in which they impact uh, young black youth. Uh, earlier this year, I did a workshop for Harris County Sheriff's Office uh, in partnership with my colleague and friend, Dr. David Jones of the Well Springs Counseling Center. Um, where so much good work is being done to help mitigate some of the issues that we're going to discuss here. Um, in the description box, you're going to find a link if you want to bring me in as a keynote speaker on epigenetics, on adverse childhood experiences, on things that can be done to mitigate these uh, influences on mental health, emotional health, and physical health. Uh, that will be a link or an email in the description box. Now, while I'm going to be reading to you some points that I put here, I want you to know that it comes from three primary renderings of my work, The Undoing of the African-American Mind, uh, which is my 23rd book. Uh, this is the exploration and introduction into the collective bias reality syndrome theory, uh, which I developed. My 19th book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, and my 24th book, Academic Apartheid, uh, which focuses on the disproportionality uh, of special education referrals for young black boys, but also the impact of the education system on black girls as well. Okay, th that's uh, just some of the work <laughs> that I've given you guys uh, in, in books alone, but I've lectured, I've spoke, I've given videos, I've written over a thousand academic articles, over 30,000 articles. I've given my life to this work. We're going to talk about epigenetics, and I'm just going to read to you and I'm going to explain it and break it down to you and tell you why it's so important that we get a grasp on this and understand the magnitude of what we're dealing with here. Uh, a brief pre uh, introduction into how I got into epigenetics in the first place. Uh, back in the 90s, that was this big argument being pushed back then. They were saying it's been 120 years uh, since slavery, 120, 100, whatever, 30 years since the end of slavery. It's time for black people to get over it, stop talking about it. It's been blah, blah, blah. And I wanted to have solid ground on which to rebut this, not so much for convincing them, but for making the argument for understanding why we are where we are and that there was certainly truthfully and scientifically substantiated proof that multi-generational or intergenerational trauma exists. And in the process, I discovered the work of epigenetics. And I'll talk about that more at another time, but I'm gonna start here with Epigenetics is an emerging area of scientific research that shows how environmental influences children's experiences actually and children's experiences actually affect and ex, uh, affect the expression of their genes. I want to be very clear here in explaining that 
while we're talking about children, epigenetic influences or environmental influences don't stop after childhood or after adulthood is reached. But because of the rapid development of young children, especially early on, the first seven to 10 years of life, there's this rapid development of brain, neurological pathways, emotional awareness, and so much more. The impact of these genetic in, uh, influences are much greater. And so we'll get off into that too. It says during development, the DNA that makes up the genes that accumulate uh, that makes up our genes accumulate chemical marks that determine how much or little of the gene is expressed. The collection of chemical marks is known as the epigenome. The different experiences children have uh, rearrange those chemical marks. This explains why genetically identical twins exhibit di exhibit different behaviors, skills, health, and achievement. Okay, so what happens is when Two people come together, male and female. There's 23 chromosomes from the female, 23 chromosomes from the male. They come together to make 46 chromosomes, which create a new human being uh, over the time of uh, the process of developing from the ovum to the fetus to uh, a child and the birthing of a child. So uh, in this DNA from these chromosomes, are the information that determine how tall the child will be, the color of the child's eyes, the temperament of the child's personality, um, whether they're going to be introvert, extrovert. All this stuff is written in the genetic code. But, but what we understand now is environmental influences can change how much of a particular gene is expressed or how the information within the gene is interpreted. So then what we're dealing with are we're dealing with understanding that in this thing, is uh, environmental influence. In other words, there's there has to be an understanding that the environment you're in, especially whether it's peaceful, whether it's stressful, whether it's supportive, is going to have a massive influence on how you physiologically process and move in the world. So then it says this means that the old idea that genes are set in stone has been disproven. Nature versus nurture is no longer a debate. It's nearly always both. Used to be this big debate, nature versus nurture. Nature said you're born this way, it is, it's the way it is. Nurture says your environment creates who you are able to become. It's both. You're born with certain genetic pre predispositions, but the environment that you're in has the capacity to uh influence the expression of a gene turn a gene on or off and that uh goes in so many different ways and we're going to talk about that in a minute but it says epigenetics explains how early experiences can have lifelong impacts the genes children inherit from their biological parents provide information that guides their development for example how tall they could eventually become or the kind of temperament they'll have when experience during development rearrange the epigenetic marks that govern gene expression they can change whether and how genes release the information they carry. So what happens is, like you said, every gene has a DNA uh, sequence. This DNA is information that tells genes and uh, what uh, to express and how to express it. So you can have cancer genes. Everybody has them. But you also have genes that are designed to fight against or to downregulate cancer genes or to all, turn them off completely. Now, the information in that is what creates our immune system. So then you have this genetic marker, but what we know now is in the, in the presence of consistent and constant stress, the genes that are responsible for our immune system are down-regulated and in some instances completely turned off. And what happens? They cannot protect against other genes. And then at the same time, stress has a tendency to up-regulate disease genes. So then you're turning off the genes that are capable of fighting diseases and you're turning on genes that create disease and this is how you end up matter of fact what we know now to be true is wild carcinogens and things like smoking and uh poor diet and all that lend to uh diseases like cancer we know now that environmental influences are the primary causality of disease that when you are in a constant state of stress, however it is expressing itself in your life, you are down-regulating healthy genes and up-regulating genes that call is illness and sickness. This is how we can see it, and it's been studied in identical twins for years, how you can see that the older that twins get, the more you're able to distinguish them apart, especially when they are in 
distinctly different environmental situations. Um, one is one that's in a highly stressful situation is going to age quicker. They're going to have more doctor's visits and more health issues. They're going to struggle with behavioral issues because it's going to impact how they view life, but it's also going to impact them on a genetic level that makes them more predisposed for risky behavior. So many other things that we have to come to an understanding of. Okay, so here we go. It says statistics on adverse childhood experiences. Now, I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to share with you the 10 most prevalent adverse childhood experiences, and these are the 10 uh, adverse childhood experiences that we literally grade or score children on. And one out of six children in America has had at least four ACEs. And that uh, something very, very um, significant happens when you reach four ACEs. And I'm going to show you what an ACE is, what qualifies as one ACE. And so each ACE gets a point, and I'll give you that in a minute. But here's what it says. One in six adults, adults experienced four or more ACEs as a child, at least five of the 10 leading causes of death are associated with ACEs. Pre preventing ACEs could reduce the number of adults with depression by as much as 44%. Preventing ACEs can potentially lower the risk of, for conditions like depression, asthma, cancer, diabetes. Preventing ACEs can reduce risky behavior like heavy drinking and smoking. Preventing ACEs can improve educational outcomes and employment uh, potential preventing ACEs could reduce up to 21 million cases of depression, up to 1.9 million cases of heart disease. Ischemic heart disease specifically is the number one killer in America, and having four ACEs makes you four times more likely to develop it. So we're not just talking about what happens in mentally and emotionally. We're talking about that the stress and the trauma of childhood can literally genetically program illness into your genes. And so we need to understand what we're doing and how we need to develop better means of protecting and providing for our children. Okay, so here, so, so here we go. I'm gonna read you the 10 most prevalent and the 10 that are normally used to score uh, children to find out where they fall on the ACE scale. Uh, ACEs, again, is adverse childhood experiences. Each adverse childhood experience, as defined here, represents one ACE. So, number one, physical abuse. Number two, verbal abuse. Number three, sexual abuse. They are distinct, and each one has an impact in and of themselves. So, you can't say, well, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, that's all abuse, so it's one. No. Each one has its own individual uh, a unique impact pattern environmentally and genetically. Okay, so then we move on to physical neglect. Here's something that's real big because we don't get it. Physical neglect and emotional neglect are real huge. And it is often seen as simply a part of how we are. You know, you, who, who hasn't heard? I don't have time right now. Go sit down. I'm busy. Go do. And we take it as being just, look, I'm trying to deal with it, and especially if we're having a bad day. It's like, go sit down somewhere, go do whatever. And what we don't realize is children at that age don't have the ability to process why you're saying what you're saying. They can't compute in their mind and their mentality that you had a bad day, that you actually love them, that you are really actually going through all the things you're going through because you love them, and that you're just having a rough day and you need a moment. They say, they're, they're, they're sensing, I, I'm not important because I just got pushed away. I don't matter because I just got pushed away. Something that I had to really teach myself with my children as I'm developing this understanding and in teaching other parents how to deal with their kids is you've got to learn how to put yourself aside. You've got to learn how to throttle and be able to deal with your children in the moment. Uh, pushing them off isn't the same as giving, telling your friend or even telling your spouse, hey, give me a minute. They might not like it, but they can process it and understand it. And they are also more emotionally, neurologically mature to be able to process it. A child can't. So you got to sit up and say, I'm going to put myself aside for a minute so I can deal with my baby. I'm going to love on them. I'm going to talk good to them. I'm going to be nice to them. And then I'm going to come back and get in my feelings after I finish. And what you'll actually find out, a lot of times when you're able to do that, you don't come back to those feelings anymore because now you realize why you're doing it. And it, it but, 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 but it's amazing how we're all impacted by this. So you've got physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical uh, neglect and emotional neglect. Number six is 
an, an alcoholic parent. Now, this isn't confined to alcoholism. This is addiction, period. But alcoholism is probably the most prevalent addiction in the home. And so that's why it's listed. Then an incarcerate number seven, an incarcerated family member. Incarceration plays a major role. That's why Harris County Sheriff's Office and Wellspring brought me in to address this issue because they have a reentry program. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce recidivism. Why? Because bringing people back into the family plugs holes. And we're starting to see how important and how uh, prevalent that is. But here's number eight, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death of abandonment. You know, while we praise single parents and, and, and I've been a single parent, so I, I understand uh, how, how important it is to have someone talk about the hard work you're putting in and the sacrifices you're making. What we must understand is there's more of a sacrifice that we may realize that there's just certain things you can't fill in. There is a difference in makeup in the femininity of a woman and the masculinity of a man. And I'm not talking about the cultural definitions of that masculinity or that femininity. I'm talking about the natural makeup of what men naturally do versus what women do, how men naturally process and think, how women naturally process and think. What we do naturally when left alone is different from one another. That means that we come together to provide a whole something for the children that we cannot provide for ourselves. We can teach ourselves to do what that person does, but where it comes from naturally, we don't possess. A woman, most black women have become providers, but there's, there's something inside that she can't give her son as to why she does it because it's not there. She does it because she has to. She does it because it's a responsibility, but there's an urging and there's a need. There's a sense of identity for a young black male as into why I provide. It's not just because it's my responsibility. It's not just because that's what men do. It's because it's a part of my identity. It's a part of my validation. It's a part of what makes me whole. And if it's not explain to me if it's not modeled to me if it's not there for me to get an understanding that's a part of me that i literally don't understand and then when i get into the ages of 14 and 15 when i'm really searching for myself and it's true and, and, and it's really important for me to develop an understanding of who i am i'm coming into myself the sense of identity now is extremely important to me if I can't identify who I am, what I believe in and faith in God, what I am responsible for as a man, how I'm going to carry myself, what are my values, my interests, and my principles? What do I hold valuable and important to me? If I can't get a clear understanding of that, I will become disruptive in my behavior because that's the way I'm going to express my frustration. We got a bunch of things that we look at kids and say how stupid they are, how crazy they are, or, 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 or how just, but we don't understand. They're searching for something that they don't know how to find. And it's in the fact that something's missing. That's why I fight so hard for the restoration of the family. That's why I'm so heavy on having a male presence in the home. And, and, and there's no such thing as a perfect man. There's no such thing as a perfect husband. There's no such thing as a perfect father. But having a person present who is given of themselves to saying, I'm going to do the best I can to provide the best environment that I can. And the best environment isn't just about the money in the home. The best environment is about the security in the home. It's about the love. It's about the... Uh, the uh, love, adoration, the elevation, the speaking into your life, all of these things that men have the capacity to do and are literally built to do because we are by what? Visual creatures, by nature. We see. Women have tuition. They feel. These things both belong in the home. Uh, but again, that's number eight, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death, or abandonment. And we have to really truly be aware of that and be cognitive of the influence and the impact of this. Then uh, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness. We are coming to grips now with the massive impact and influence of mental illness within the black community. Uh, it is taboo. It carries a stigma. Our men literally refuse to get help and yet it is raging and wreaking havoc and ravaging our community. We're going to have to deal with that. But here's the thing. When we don't deal with it, we don't address with it. When we did, when we're looking at this, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, ACE. And finally, a mother who's a victim of domestic violence. We understand that we have a 20 something percent occurrence, 24% male or female, but 24% intimate partner violence. Um, so, 
So um, there, there, there are these things. So now here's the thing. Just takes four. A child with four aces, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide as an adult. Four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, number one killer. Four times more de to develop uh, depression, uh, to develop uh, lupus, to, to develop um, uh, um, diabetes, and I can go on and on. So let's, let's keep moving. Thus, the epigenome can be affected by positive experiences such as supportive relationships and opportunities for learning or negative influences such as environmental toxins or stressful life circumstances which leave a unique epigenetic signature on the genes. See, here's the thing. We talk about it from a spiritual perspective, but that's also a physiological and genetic uh, explanation. We talk about the importance of positivity in healing that you can literally heal yourself. What happens is when I put myself in the right environment, my body is naturally designed to heal itself. It's naturally designed to fight off um, uh, things that make me sick or that, that are damaging to me. It's naturally designed, but I have to have it in a healthy position. I have to have it in what we may call uh, equilibrium or home homeostasis. And what that means is that mentally, emotionally, physiologically, I'm in the best state I can be in. So I need to be eating right. I need to be thinking right. I need to be in an environment that's supportive, that's peaceful, that's less stressful. So I need to know how to what? To manage stress. But if I am a child, I don't have the capacity to manage stress. So what do I need? I need adults around me managing the stress for me. I need adults around me with an understanding and, an, and a commitment to creating an environment of healthiness, an environment of support, an environment of love uh, and encouragement. And it's extremely important. Then let, let, let's go on. These signatures can be temporary or permanent, and both types affect how easily the genes are switched on and off. Recent research demonstrates that there may be ways to reverse certain negative changes and restore healthy functions, but the very best strategy is to support responsive relationships and reduce stress to build strong brains from the beginning. It was Frederick Douglass who said, it's so much easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. Uh, this has not, uh, never been more uh, expressive than what we see in the epigenetic play out of our human health, our human emotional well-being, our human psychological and neurological well-being is the environments we create. Now, what we have to understand is epigenetics in and of itself is not a bad thing nor a good thing. Epigenetics is neutral. It is the responsiveness of our genes to our environment. So we determine how epigenetics will play out in our lives. It's, uh, there's no absence from it. There's no escape from it. It's happening. So is it happening from a positive place or is it happening from a negative place? <music> It's our responsibility to create a positive environment and protect our children from negative influences and negative environments that will have long reaching implications even into their physiological helps in their entire life. This isn't something that, okay, well, it goes away, but what we can do and what we do know now by placing them in the right environment, by uh, having the right, having the capacity and the ability to be able to interview children, to know when they are in highly stressful situations. It's so many times I wrote in Academic Apartheid about the disproportionality of special education referrals of young black males. What we don't realize is in an environment where 75 to 80 percent of the teachers are white female and you're looking at a black male and he's not behaving the way they want him to, the automatic assumption is he has a learning disability. Nobody's looking in the cultural reality or the uh, definition of the type of uh, environment he's growing up in. Number one, culturally he's going to be different than a, Euro, a, a European um, uh, grounded child. His his experience is different. Doesn't mean he's a bad child. Doesn't mean that something is inherently wrong with him. If Number one, he's coming from a different culture where behavior is simply different. But he's also maybe coming from an environment where he's struggling with some of these aces. Maybe there's a family member with mental illness. Maybe there's a family member dealing with psychological 
I mean, dealing with alcoholism, maybe there's a family member that is neglecting him or being mean to him or abusive to him. All these different things add up and it's going to have an impact on how he expresses himself, but it's also going to have a long reaching impact on his health. But nobody's looking at that. What do they want to do? They want to put him in special education, uh, assign a tag to him uh, of either oppositional defined disorder or ADHD, both which they will medicate him with psychotropic drugs, which again alters the state of the brain and creates an alternative chemistry in the brain, which has long reaching effects using schedule two drugs, which mean they are highly uh, addictive. Now you have a five year old addicted to a stimulant that happens to do the reverse in him most likely, and that's keep him mellowed and laid back, but not highly functional. They just want him to be still. They don't want him to be in the way. They don't want him disrupting the class. So we're going to drug him. These are the things that we deal with. These are the things that we need to be aware of. These are the things that we need to be taking action on. There's so much more work to be done. There's so much more research need to be done. There are many more programs that need to be developed, but we have to start somewhere. Here, here we go. I'm almost done. Your brains are particularly sensitive to epigenetic changes when you are young. So again, 10 and under, we have to understand that you are growing at a rapid pace. Just think about a, 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 an infant between the first, from the first day of their born to their first year, a bunch of growth. Same thing from the next four or five years, they're growing rapidly. Well, at the same time, they are creating new neurosynaptic connections in their brain, but they're also growing at a rapid pace. And so any changes or alterations in the natural development of how they are growing will impact how genes are expressed. So let's read, it says, experiences very early in life when the brain is developing most rapidly cause epigenetic adaptations that influence whether, when, and how genes release their instructions for building future capacity and health skills and resilience. That is why it's crucial to provide supportive and nurturing experiences for children in their earliest years. Again, your genes have information. How that information is expressed. One gene's information says that anything that happens that is volatile towards the body, I turn the gene off. I fight it. I release antibodies. I do whatever to make sure that the body stays healthy. Well, if there's an environmental influence of negative, negative environment where there's stress, where there's hostility, where there's a bunch of anger and negative energy, what happens is that gene is suppressed to the point of even being turned off. So it can turn it on, it can upregulate it, it can downregulate it, it can turn it off. And so that happens in every area. So what happens is we know for a fact that when a child is in a supportive environment, when a child is in an encouraging and uplifting environment, when a child is getting the attention necessary, that they upregulate those positive genetic uh, codes and the genes that need to express themselves most, po most positively are. You can sit up and stunt children's growth. You can sit up and take a child who has the, a, a, a coding of brilliance and really stifle that in the early developmental years. You'll have kids that will become suppressed, withdrawn, introverted, that were naturally initially going to be extroverted, highly engaging people and you wonder what's going on with them it's an environmental issue it's not just an emotional issue it's not simply just in the psychological issue you've got to understand that there are things happening with them on a physiological level that can be directly related to the environment now it's very important to understand that while the focus here today is on children that this is happening with adults as well if you are in a highly stressful situation you are going to more likely experience physiological illnesses so then it is imperative for us to learn how to create positive environments around ourselves. But we have an innate responsibility to create these positive environments for our children. Those who cannot create these environments for themselves. Um, and we can go on. I think that's where I'm going to stop at with this today. But I mean, I've, I've, I've put so much energy, effort, work and uh, passion into this and there's st still so much to go but one of the reasons i created black men lead was we needed to create an environment so that we could better socialize young black males because in properly socializing them we reduce their proclivity towards violence we uh, we increase uh their chance of graduating which reduces their risk of becoming incarcerated we also increase their risk of developing skills that will allow them to earn livable wages and be able to support and sustain a family this is immensely important but we also in that process get to create an environment where they feel loved where they feel protected where they feel cared 
prepared for it. And what does that do? That lowers the impact of any adverse childhood experiences they may be experiencing at home. We also have wraparound services to where we can literally engage parents within the home to help them because most parents aren't purposely saying, I'm going to create this stressful environment for my child to ensure that they're going to have a life full of challenges. Most parents are dealing with their own issues coming out of childhood adverse, exp adverse childhood experiences of their own, coming out of traumatic experiences as ch children of, in their own right, and now they're trying to simply make things happen in this world and this world is moving a hundred miles an hour for them and so they are acting from their own trauma and we need to learn how to address that one of the things that i write about in the undoing of the african-american mind and if you want to get either of those books the links are going to be in the description box but let me be very clear here there's work to be done. There's a responsibility that, that, uh, 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 of doing this thing. And we are going to have to, as a people, learn how to focus on the things that will bring the greatest gain for us. We are far too easily drawn away with sensationalism. We love to be entertained. We love to be, we love to laugh. We love to see things and go places and all that stuff is good, but we aren't working on home. We aren't fixing home. We aren't growing ourselves so that we are positive influences on the people around us. We are caught up in this keeping up with the Jones is caught up with presenting ourselves in a way that we can be accepted and liked. We're, 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 we, we, we've become great pretenders in poor performance. And the thing is, that's got to change because what we're doing is we're passing down trauma. We're passing down lethargy. We're passing down an entitled mindset. We're passing down poor performance. We're passing down an accepted idea that they are more superior than us. We're passing down an accepted idea that we're stuck in a situation that we cannot get out of when the truth of the matter is the answer is in the commitment to change. Someone asked, what drives you to have put in as many as 80,000 hours in researching the black dilemma because I'm black and I'm producing black children that will produce black children that will produce black children that descend from me and there's something inside of me that cares about what those descendants of mine will experience in this world and there's something in me that understands that I have the power within me to stop the suffering here and then after a certain level of understanding, I realized that I can teach it to other people, that I can create programs that will uh, in, allow and enable others to do the same, that this is how we heal. This is how we become empowered. This is how we redevelop and re-strengthen the uh, capacity to unify. This is how we restore the family. By restoring the family, we open up the avenue to inculcate into the minds of young, children, young black children the values, interests, and principles that further the race. If we don't do that, we don't have a chance. If we don't recover the family, we don't have a chance. If we don't create an environment where we can grow and heal, we're going to continue to act out of our frustrations and our trauma, and we're going to only traumatize ourselves and others more, and we're never going to experience what we are capable of experiencing if we get the right thing in alignment with what we should be doing. It's that simple. I didn't say it was easy, but we've got to start somewhere. I hope that this opens up some uh, channels of discussion. I hope that this challenges those who really truly are about black empowerment to step up and say we need to be doing more than what we're doing. I hope that this challenges parents to understand the importance of working around their differences so that they can provide the right environment for their children to prosper. We need to grow up as men and women. We need to become committed to being what we are capable of being. And that's acknowledging that there's some work to be done and doing the work. I really truly, again, hope that this does make you 
uh, truly give some thought to what's going on around us. I often say that we are where we are because we don't understand how things work. And the, and the, and the truth of the matter is there are people out there, unbelievable minds that came long before Dr. Wallace decided to pick up a book. But 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 the, uh, the, the Francis Cress Wilsons, the Carter G. Woodsons, the Frederick Douglasses, the Malcolm X's, uh, the Amos Wilsons, the, the, the Dr. Naeem Agbars, the Dr. Jordan Grider, Dr. Harwood Stevens, Dr. Khaled Muhammad, and I can go on and on. Dr. Chancellor Williams, and just on and on. Dr. Anthony Brock, there's so many that are coming in from their fields of expertise providing it, and all we're doing is snatching on it and throwing it on memes. And we're missing the point that this is not meant for us to throw up and, and, and floss on. It's meant for us to say, wait a minute, I see where this this piece of the puzzle belongs. Let me stick it right in here. I see where this th th this gap of this chasm is. Let me fill it with, with this information and knowledge. I, I see where we are missing here, what we need here. Let me, do this is what it was meant for. We wasted so much of the brilliance that has come before us that we are losing at an astronomical level in every way that you can measure uh, human existence in our culture and in our society, we're in last place. And we constantly stay there. While questionably, while arguably, let me put it, while arguably being the most brilliant and creative on the planet, we're in last place. So then you have to ask yourself, how does something of that statistical significance happen? Lack of in engagement, lack of commitment, Lack of a willingness to be responsible for something other than just being happy. And most of that happiness is, is created and, and manufactured and pretended and, and pretensive. It's time to stand up. It's time to make some things happen. So this is my challenge. It's time to find something to invest yourself in. Everybody's not a researcher. Everybody's not a writer or an author. Everybody's not a lecturer. Everybody's not a school teacher. Everybody, but everybody has a role. Everybody has a place, a place that they belong. Some people are going to be the researchers and the lecturers. Some people are going to be the program developers. Some people are going to be the warriors on the front line. Some people are going to be the one who finance the movement. But whatever it is that you are, you have a responsibility to stand up, stand firm, and step out. There is no escaping that. We keep talking about where we are, but we keep doing nothing about it. That's the reality of it. On that note, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, we're consistently forwardly moving on with our programs, with our research, with uh, with our research center, with our think tank, uh, program development, wraparound services. We will continue to do everything that we possibly can, uh, but we do need support. If you believe in the work that we've done, specifically the work I've done over the last 30 years, the work that you've seen or heard me do, or the work, uh, do it. Show some love, show some support. Finally, if you want me to come out and do a conference, a workshop, a lecture, anything to help you in your community get things going, there's going to be a email link that will be to my support team. Email my support team and let them know what you want me to uh, come do. And we will put it together and we will make it happen. Uh, I am not going to cover the cost of it because I'm eating so much cost now and we're getting no support. But I will be there. We will figure it out. We will work it out. But we have work to do. On that note, I'm out of here. Again, thank you. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, look, I'm not going to be long. I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look, the easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do 
is to take action, to do something to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, a, a, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via cash app, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, cash app account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate. Uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement. We are trying to make a difference, but we do need support. This is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst. It's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Oh,